Welcome to another CCAST talk. My name is Chris Primiano, director of CCAST. For tonight's event, we have with us Joanna Lillis. Joanna is a journalist based here in, in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Uh, Joanna will be talking about her book, or her or, uh, new edition of her book, Dark Shadows, The Secret World of Kazakhstan. Uh, during the talk, I encourage audience members to send me any questions or comments for Joanna. And during the Q&A session, I'll pose those questions and comments to her. So Joanna will talk for about uh, 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So Joanna, welcome back to CCASC, and we look forward to hearing about your updated version of your book. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and um, I'd like to start by thanking our hosts at uh, CCASC, at KIMEP, um, and Chris, of course, and Mariam as well for organizing. Um, so, yes, I'm here to talk about um, the new, newly released um, paperback version of Dark Shadows. So I'm going to start by um, sharing my um, screen with you. Um, so can everybody, can you see that? Can you give me a thumbs up, Chris? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Um, so, um, Dark Shadows. This is um, the new paperback version of Dark Shadows, which came out uh, three and a half years ago, um, the original hardback version. So much has happened in Kazakhstan and in the region and in the world. It's almost like a new country and um, a new region and a, a new kind of world order and a new order in Kazakhstan. Since Dark Shadows first came out, um, there was so much that um, I found that I needed to update when I was working on um, on the paperback version of Dark Shadows. And um, in actual fact, I uh, sent the final manuscript um, to the publisher of the paperback version on um, New Year's Eve. And of course, on 2nd of January, as we know, um, Kazakhstan began to um, implode, <laughs> if, we, if that's not too much of an exaggeration to say. That's when um, the, the, the protest began um, that culminated in what has now come to be known in Kazakhstan as Kandy Kantar or Bloody January. Um, so um, um, what's new in Dark Shadows? Well, um, as I said, I sent the uh, what was meant to be the final version of the manuscript to the publisher um, just when um, those January uh, that, that January unrest uh, began to break, break out. Um, so it's not fully covered in Dark Shadows, but what we have is a, a new chapter um, on um, the political transition in Kazakhstan, the resignation of Nursultan Nazarbayev in uh, 2019, the rise to power of um, Kasim Shamar Tokayev, his designated successor. So a whole new chapter on that transition and some of the unrest that it sparked, which of course we can now see as some kind of precursor um, to bloody January. Now, um, um, after a little bit of wrangling with the publisher, I uh, recalled the manuscript and managed to, to get a very short afterward in on um, bloody January. Um, and, um, and so there is a short afterward, there's a full chapter on the transition and a short afterward on, um, on, on that unrest in January, um, which as we know, um, tragically led, led to at least 230 deaths. Um, what else is new in Dark Shadows? Uh, before I recap a little bit about um, the general content of Dark Shadows, um, I, I'd like to also um, ju just um, talk about the other main new chapter, which is about the Kazakhs of Xinjiang, and more specifically uh, about the um, about the activism that uh, took shape in Kazakhstan because of the uh, repressions and persecutions against the uh, Kazakhs, alongside, of course, the much more numerous Uyghur community and other uh, Muslims, um, Turkic Muslims and other Muslims in, in Xinjiang, in northwestern China, over recent years. Now, the original, um, the original Dark Shadows um, edition uh, contains some reporting, actually, from Xinjiang, but over a decade ago, about how the Kazakhs felt uh, squeezed off their land. Uh, but this new edition contains a chapter on the activism, not, not from Xinjiang, but the activism that has been taking place here in Kazakhstan. Um, so I'd just like to play you, in fact, um, a, uh, a reel, um, uh, which um, 
which shows what's new in uh, Dark Shadow. So I, um, it's got a bit of music alongside it. So if you don't want it, if you don't want it to be deafened, maybe turn your volume down a little bit. It's only 30 seconds, but this is summarizing um, some of the new content in Dark Shadows. So sorry if that deafened um, anybody, uh, but that's the new or more specifically the activism inside Kazakhstan. Um, so I'd just like to talk a little bit about um, how that fits into the content um, generally of Dark Shadows and how that fits into Kazakhstan as we know it today. Uh, but before that, I'd like to go back to where Dark Shadows actually started. And this was back in um, 2015. Um, so it seems um, a long time ago now, as I said, especially since so much has changed. But in 2015, Dark Shadows actually uh, started on this lonely looking road um, up in eastern Kazakhstan. As you can see, it's a cold uh, day with snowdrifts blowing across the road. And on this day in February 2015, um, I drove to a village called Kalachi, which some of you may remember, or some of you may not, um, had hit the sort of international even headlines, which we're not always used to in Kazakhstan, for uh, something very strange that was happening in Kalachi. Um, people were falling asleep for days on end for no reason whatsoever. Now, there was a lot of um, writing about this in the international media, but I decided to um, go up there. Uh, it's quite difficult to reach, as you can see, to find out what was going on. Um, and there I spoke to um, some of the people who were affected by this. And this is uh, one woman whose husband had actually fallen asleep a couple of times. Um, dropped off and dropped into a coma for about five days or something like that. At one point when he was driving his motorbike along the step with her on the back of it. Um, now, why, why did this uh, lead to dark shadows? Well, um, what happened was the publisher, um, Ivy Taurus at the time, now taken over by Bloomsbury, um, saw this story that I wrote in The Guardian and became interested and asked if I'd be interested in writing a book on Kazakhstan. And of course, I said yes. Um, why that story also gripped me was that it seemed to me so, uh, so first of all, of course, unusual, but also um, telling about um, things in Kazakhstan that don't necessarily always spring to mind or didn't spring to mind at that time, as well as some more obvious things. Now, this was a story about environmental disaster, as it turned out, about man-made environmental problems damaging the health of uh, people living around these disaster zones that uh, were left behind by the Soviet Union. Uh, the problem, the, the cause of this um, sleeping sickness turned out to be um, emissions from an abandoned uh, uranium mine around this village called Kalachi, um, up, up to the sort of north uh, west of Astana at the time, the capital. Um, and so uh, this was very emblematic to me of some of the other uh, environmental problems that I also write about in Dark Shadows, including the shrinking of the Aral Sea and the um, disaster wrought on people's health by the uh, testing ground at Semipalatinsk that closed, the nuclear testing ground, I'm sorry, that closed in 1991. Um, but this also struck me as incredibly interesting because what, what I saw in, in the village of Kalachi was um, a very truculent load of uh, villagers um, really pushing back against um, the local authorities and the national authorities, the national government too, um, that were determined to resettle everybody from the village because they couldn't find the cause of the problem. And, um, you know, at the time, it was um, perhaps more, much more unusual then than it is today to find people resisting the government. But what, what struck me is that all over Kazakhstan, there were people who were resisting the government and who were 
um, distrustful of their government because these villagers, with, we, we don't believe what the government's telling us. We think they're trying to force us out of our village and close us down, which I don't think they were at all. They were obviously worried about their health. But this um, uh, made me think about this kind of disconnect between rulers and ruled, which I think has really gathered pace over these years, um, coming to a head uh, first in 2019 with the resignation of, of Nazarbayev when people took to the streets to protest, and of course, um, this January. Um, moving on then to Nazarbayev himself, to Kazakhstan, to the, to the Kazakhstan he formed. Well, um, okay, Nazarbayev may be um, yesterday's man right now in Kazakhstan, uh, but Dark Shadows um, is an attempt to... Um, to give a portrait of modern day Kazakhstan and no portrait of modern day Kazakhstan can be without um, a portrait of the man who ruled it for, for um, well, 30 years, if you include the two years when he was at the helm, uh, when it was still part of the Soviet Union. Now, um, I opened Dark Shadows with actually this event in Astana back in 2008 when Astana was celebrating its um, um, uh, 2000, uh, its 15th anniversary, sorry, as the capital of Kazakhstan. Uh, but we saw a real kind of um, cult of personality of Nazarbayev emerging at that time. Um, and, you know, already um, certain people were, were predicting that this could end in tears for Kazakhstan, that this was not a way to fashion a very resilient system. Now, this we've seen, we've seen celebrations of a city um, with Nazarbayev kind of um, increasingly, um, you know, becoming becoming increasingly the focus of attention, as if um, very much l'état c'est moi, um, the, the the idea that without Nazarbayev there is no state, that everything is thanks to Nazarbayev. Now we now see where that actually led us, because if there's no state without Nazarbayev, then you know the state risks um, disintegrating, and we've really seen over the last three years, um, coming to a head in January, um, the problems that. Um, have arisen as a result of the system that I tried to depict um, in Dark Shadows. Um, you know, the, I, I tried to explain how elections are run in Kazakhstan. Now, if we are to believe uh, President Tokayev, everything's going to be different very soon. Uh, we're, we're heading for a referendum on June the 5th. Uh, to change um, one third of the constitution if the people uh, agree, which they almost certainly will. Um, but I also, um, I think uh, what's, I, what I think is important is to, uh, to kind of understand actually how ill-equipped the people are to make this choice, um, given the way that they have been treated as children uh, in elections for the last 30 years, and especially over the last, I would say, maybe... Um, more than a decade, certainly elections have become very much, or have until now, um, become very much mm, micromanaged trying to um, cement the choice of the leadership or legitimise, um, really, I mean, in the in, in last year's Nazarbayev's rule, just to legitimise him and his rule. Um, now, uh, what's always struck me about elections in Kazakhstan, and this photograph is intended to um, illustrate that, is uh, the festive atmosphere. It's not like a serious exercise in democracy, but like a party. Now, um, Tokayev promised when he came to power that everything would be different already. When he saw the people out there protesting, he said he would create, in 2019, he said he would create political competition. Um, however, in 2021, uh, we saw exactly this type of election in Kazakhstan. We saw Kazakhstan elect an identical parliament, the same three parties in there has, that had been in there for a decade, no opposition parties in existence at all, able to stand in elections. Now, as I say, Tokayev, and as you no doubt all know, Tokayev is promising that everything is about to change. Um, in the constitution, uh, there will be changes. Um, political parties, he says, will be easier to register. But what is going to count is whether um, they will be registered, not what is written in the constitution about the number of signatures required to register them. So I think um, we should all be watching as well. Will there be an early election in Kazakhstan? Because I think the, that that's very much, much what some people would like to see a fair election for the first time in 30 years that they can exercise their right to a political voice. Um, again, this is just, um, you know, the cult of Nazarbayev. Now, um, where are we now? Well, 
um, I, I, I think we could all see all, all around us the cult of Nazarbayev is being dismantled, although cautiously, um, since obviously for Tokayev it's somewhat problematic because he emerged from the Nazarbayev system and it's his, his de designated successor. But um, if the constitutional changes pass, I mean, one of the main things that we'll see is Nazarbayev removes um, from the constitution his special status and powers, his name, and um, him reduced to the status of a mere mortal, um, like everyone else in Kazakhstan. What we probably won't see, um, at least um, in the initial stages, is the dismantling of statues like this. Um, what, we, uh, what we are already seeing is dismantling of some of his relatives' business empires, but selectively. So I think we're all watching to see where it goes. Um, here, of course, um, uh, certainly can't be confused with any other city. This is the city called Nur Sultan. Um, already we're hearing calls for um, the city that's gone through so many name changes in its history to be called by something else again. I mean, many people would like it to refer to revert to Astana. Um, this is a bit of a symbol of what Nazarbayev built, and it's also a symbol of where the wealth went. Um, and so, you know, many people in January came out to complain that, well, not that it's so much that it went into the building of Astana, but that it went into people's pockets and that people have not over 30 years, or certainly since um, the oil boom began in 2000 or, or in the 90s, um, benefited. People feel they haven't benefited sufficiently, and this is a real symbol of that. And, and the city of Nur Sultan is a real symbol of the province of one man rule, I think. And that's what, um, you know, what I tried to illustrate in dark shadows, even before Nazarbayev resigned and these protests started and Kazakhstan erupted into violence in January. Um, here we have these two um, during the political transition in 2019. They're looking very pleased with themselves, but uh, the people weren't so pleased. As we can see now, this I described quite thoroughly in the new chapter. Um, in dark shadows, what happened when Nazarbayev resigned? He he wanted to um, deliver. He he said he wanted to resign in his lifetime to deliver continuity and stability. As here, he delivered the exact opposite. What he actually got was a people coming out and saying, "Why are you deciding everything for us? Why don't you listen to our voices?" And you know, um, I have a choice was one of the slogans of protesters in 2019. And here we see them coming out really in, um, in, in large numbers for Kazakhstan, although nowhere near as large as they came out in January, certainly. Um, and you can't quite see um, the, the, what they're carrying there, uh, but they're carrying um, a, a, a placard or a sheet um, that says no to sort of abuse and no to dictatorship. Um, so the people were already saying that they wanted their voice. Now, I think that's the problem um, that we saw in January. And I, I think the, the new chapter in Dark Shadows, I hope, illustrates how people felt that and feel that they're not listened to. Um, Tokayev heard them say that, and he said he would create a listening state. That's his buzzword. But, he's, but still, they felt they weren't being listened to, and still they came out in January. Now, this shouldn't have been a surprise. This is not from 2019. This photo is from 2016. Um, when um, really Kazakhstan saw the first large protest it had seen for many years when people came out um, and protested over land reform. And that should have been a wake-up call for the government, but it really wasn't. Um, you know, they just carried on, carried on doing what they were already doing. Um, and, and so I just uh, should say that I have a whole chapter on that um, attempt by the people to make their voices heard in the original Dark Shadows. Um, also, let's go back a bit. Um, 2nd of January, where did the protests start this year? They started in this town, Zhangozen, um, Kazakhstan's most troubled town out in the west in the oil fields, um, where the oil workers have since, um, since uh, 2011, which is when I took this photograph, uh, been complaining that the government doesn't listen to their grievances. Um, not so much that, they're un, that they are low paid, because these are among the highest paid um, ordinary workers in the country. I, I won't say, we won't talk about the oligarchs, the business people. Um, but they have been complaining about something. So for over a decade now, they have been complaining about something that ordinary people feel very strongly, which is that they don't feel the benefit of the oil wealth. And um, this is uh, what they did to uh, the main oil company in Zhang Zen when um, unrest broke out on Independence Day in December 2011. Um, you know, tragically, of course, at least uh, 
19 deaths were all caused by um, the security forces who opened fire on the unarmed protesters. I mean, we have obviously um, conflicting narratives about what happened, but certainly some people ended up with very serious injuries as well. And what I'm trying to say by that is in order to understand maybe what happened in uh, bloody January, we need to go back and feel these grievances that the government failed to listen to all this time, but they were all there for us to see because uh, here's the evidence to prove it. Um, and that's where we, we got to in um, January 2022, storming the Akimat and setting fire to it. Now, um, uh, uh, it's a, a very complicated sequence of events that we, we still don't understand. We know that violent forces um, also got involved and fomented um, violence and and, uh, uh, and that the, the arrest in Amati was not um, was by no means uh, purely a purely um, peaceful protesters we know that many things were happening but but um, certainly the system bred something bred something dangerous and um, you know all this is coming out of the transition the end of the Nazarbayev rule as I see it and um, I hope that Dr. Shannon's office a portrait of that rule that's the eerie scenes inside the Akimat just a, a few days um, after in January where the whole um, the whole uh, city hall um, remains in that kind of condition now although it's being repaired and here are some of the gunshot wound victims who were dragged by, from their hospital beds by the security forces um, in, um, in January uh, because it has been decided that anyone who got shot uh, must automatically be a criminal. Um, so these people all facing charges, still in illegal limbo, still don't know what's going to happen to them, facing um, quite long prison terms. Um, so some of them are out on bail, some of them not, but still some pro a lot of problems with delivering justice um, for that um, unrest. And I, in Dark Shadows, there are many, um, I think one of my bugbears is the um, inability of Kazakhstan and many other post-Soviet countries actually to deliver justice when things go wrong. I mean, we, I, I portray many, um, many um, different kind of trials in Dark Shadows over the years, including um, the, that those involving the murder of Altenbeck Sarsenbayev back in 2006 when um, uh, the first trial delivered total miscarriage of justice before the government decided or the authorities decided that Nazarbayev's son-in-law ordered the killing and a retrial was held. Um, let's move forward a bit. Um, now this is a much more recent um, protests in Kazakhstan um, just um, a month or so ago, um, an anti-war protest in Kazakhstan um, this man holds the Ukrainian flag. Now, um, in Dark Shadows, um, I reported from in 2014 after um, Russia annexed Crimea and um, and uh, fermented separatist um, um, unrest in southeastern um, Ukraine, northern Kazakhstan about pro-Russian moods. And so, I think the background to how um, how difficult uh, what it. it the background to what a difficult situation Kazakhstan finds itself in today, um, with uh, the war going on in Ukraine, um, can be you know can be explained in dark shadows. Although of course the war happened after publication, um, we'll skip through that because we're running short of time. Um, also, um, so uh, what in in many ways having a large Russian minority for Kazakhstan has um, you know makes the war in Ukraine particularly kind of. Uh, uh, resonant and minorities in Kazakhstan really the the whole minorities po policy um, has has been to um, welcome minorities which is laudable but to brush over any problems now this scene is after a small clash in South Kazakhstan back in 2015 among Tajiks and Kazakhs but this scene um, is from much more recently this is from 2020 the village of Masanchi on the border with Kyrgyzstan where um, where Kazakh mobs attacked uh, Dungan villages and um, left at least 11 people dead. And that's another um, updated part of Dark Shadows, um, which, um, yeah, which, as I say, it, 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 it's all about um, perhaps um, the Nazarbayev legacy and um, where it's gone wrong. Uh, you know, the, the idea of papering over cracks, um, and that applies to the, the political system as well as ethnic policy. Papering, uh, papering over cracks doesn't seem to have worked. Um, Tokayev seems to be taking that on board, but um, we can all see that Kazakhstan has a lot of interesting times ahead. Um, we all know the Chinese pro proverb, 
um, or curse rather, may you live interesting times. But let's hope that Kazakhstan comes through it, um, you know, um, in a positive way. Um, finally, here, um, I've just one more minute before I finish. Um, uh, I mentioned before that I've updated, um, there's a whole new chapter on the Kazakhs of Xinjiang, the activism in Kazakhstan over, um, over the last few years, um, how uh, Kazakhstan became a center of activism um, over the, the uh, persecution of Muslims, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Hui in the, in the camps of Xinjiang. These people, um, this was uh, taken last year, I think, when they'd been protesting. These are Kazakhs who came from Xinjiang, whose relatives are in jails or disappeared in China, in Xinjiang. And they were protesting, for, they'd been protesting for 100 days at that point outside the Chinese consulate in Almaty. And they are still protesting now. I think it, we're up to about 450 days. Um, but to learn more about that, please read. Um, and that's my summary of, um, of what's new and also why I hope Dark Shadows remains um, relevant um, as, we, as, we, as we tackle the, you know, as Kazakhstan tackles the problems that it faces now. Thank you for your attention. Excellent, thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, and yes, um, currently, uh, QMIP Library does not have a copy, but I have requested uh, a copy of your book. So hopefully the QMIP Library will have that soon. So audience members, feel free to send me any questions or comments that you have, and I will pose those to jo Joanna. Uh, let's go. Let's start off with some questions that have been submitted uh, previously. So this question asks, Joanna, what are your key predictions for Kazakhstan in the next two years? political, economic, and social? Wow, that's a tough question to, <laughs> to start with. Um, well, um, let's start with political. Mm, I mean, I, I think in the immediate term, it seems that, um, you know, Tokayev's um, reforms will be passed because, um, you know, it, 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 the alternative doesn't seem to be, um, it's, it's a strange question in a way to ask people uh, do you agree with the 56 changes to the constitution or not it's a yes no question and also people are kind of used to going out and voting yes to what the government wants um i think um uh, my, my key prediction politically i i mean I, i'll probably stick my neck out and say that Tokayev will uh, manage to consolidate power although you know i mean he's already consolidated his power after coming under what he certainly perceived as a, a big threat to his rule in January. I mean, he has called it a, an attempt to coup d'etat. Um, that's debatable. But um, I think, you know, he's obviously emerged stronger in, in the short term. His, his taking on of the, of, of the Nazarbayev family and reduction of Nazarbayev's power suggests that he, you know, he's consolidating his power. But uh, his um, reforms suggest that he knows that he needs, as a power base, he needs the people. Um, but, you know, I don't think, um, you know, from what I hear people saying on the streets, I don't think everybody's on side. I don't think everybody's that enthusiastic. And I, I, I you know, I think some people would like more far reaching reforms. And I think I, I, all I can say is I think that, he, that, that um, even if he, you know, as he continues, I think that um, this contempt will continue to simmer under the surface unless he can really do some big ticket reforms that tackle that, tackles that, that tackle that. Um, and economically, I mean, that's all tied up as well, talking about a much fairer economy, about getting rid of all the vested or some of the vested interests and the corruption. But I think that's a really big ask. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's so entrenched that I think that's going to be very difficult. Um, but he may manage to deliver some um, changes, I mean, with reforms to, 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 to the holding company that owns all the state um, assets. Uh, by frightening, uh, clearly by frightening some people by, um, you know, the arrest of Nazarbayev's nephew um, over on corruption charges is a big signal. But of course, no other members of the family arrested. Socially, very difficult uh, couple of years ahead. I mean, people remain discontented. I mean, it, the government's own figures said that 50,000 people were took to the street in Kazakhstan in um, January. Now, all those people haven't gone away. So I think, we're, you know, I, 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 I really couldn't predict if we're going to see that type of unrest again. Um, but I, I do, I predict a difficult uh, couple of years ahead, politically, economically, and socially. To what extent does Kazakhstan have agency regarding dealing with great power neighbors? Oh, well, that's, that's really very difficult. Um, I mean, um, 
obviously the biggest great power neighbor or certainly the most um, important one because then is Russia and um, you know as if uh, for Tukayev this is very difficult I mean as if he didn't already have his hands full with the, the domestic situation and um, the invasion of Ukraine um, a month after or just over a month after um, creates obviously another headache and that's an understatement I, th I mean I don't you know, obviously, it doesn't have complete agency uh, because Kazakhstan is subject to um, things that restrain what it can do, uh, um, including fears of Russian expansionism and aggression. I mean, we, it, not to put too fine a point on it, that's obvious from what Russia has done to Ukraine. Um, however, what I would uh, add is that I, many people have been surprised um, uh, that Kazakhstan has managed to. Uh, to sort of push back against pressure to actually support Russia over this and has uh, maintained what it describes itself as a neutral stance um, and has um, you know, not succumbed to any pressure to recognize the breakaway territories of, UK, of um, Ukraine, uh, the Russian backed ones, and, and has, um, you know, um, for example, Dokhaev also um, speaking to um, Zelensky as well as more, much more regularly to Putin. So we can see that Takaya believes he has some agency. Of course, what we don't know is um, is um, whether there'll be payback for trying to strike. I don't know if we could call it an independent stance, but I suppose we could because it's not um, supporting Russia. So, um, you know, Russia is a vengeful beast uh, right now. And we can see how um, commentators, rabid commentators, um, are attacking Kazakhstan in the Russian media, on social media. Now, every time Kazakhstan complains about that officially, the, the government, the Russian government, he says, well, they're just, you know, people commenting or whatever. It's not an official line. But, you know, we, we do, we can see that these are uh, clearly officially backed um, attacks on Kazakhstan. So I, um, I, I think I think Tokayev wants to make sure that Kazakhstan continues to have some agency because um, the alternative is um, to become Belarus and simply want everything that Russia wants. But as I say, the payback will be um, down the line. We don't know yet. It, on the topic of um, the whole Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, so, and then prior to with the events, uh, some people had said that given how Putin bailed Tokayev out uh, with the CSTO um, involvement in, in Kazakhstan uh, to shore up support uh, for Tokayev, that Tokayev would owe Putin, um, that he would essentially, that Tokayev would essentially be a puppet um, of Putin uh, because of Putin's uh, enabling uh, Tokayev's regime to survive. Um, so were you, uh, uh, if you could assess that viewpoint, um, were you skeptical of how some people were saying that uh, because of CSTO involvement that, uh, that this would mean like the end of multi-vectorism uh, and how um, Tokayev is firmly in the, the Putin camp? Um, so if you could assess that argument uh, in terms of um, Tokayev owing Putin for CSTO involvement. And support um well it's certainly a strong argument obviously because um and it's one that all these russian commentators who are attacking kazakhstan keep making they keep accusing accusing kazakhstan of being ungrateful disloyal um saying that oh we bailed we bailed you out and now look what you're doing um so you, you know i think it's clear that um i'm sure the russians think kazakhstan owes them um Tukayev has himself expressed his gratitude has said that um has, has said um, not so much that that support was essential to sort of winning the battle in inverted commas for Almaty, but um, that he, he's talked about the psychological support um, that that provided. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that um, they're not being given enough attention about in summoning the CSTO troops, most of whom um, from Russia, um, is, is the, the signal that he was trying to send by um, showing his opponents, I have Putin's backing. Um, now, it's clear that that, that was um, a crucial um, aspect to his idea of summoning them and to, to how things played out too, perhaps. Um, but um, as for owing Putin one, I mean, I think that there's a quid pro quo seems um, almost inevitable uh, because um, Putin's not a character for doing something out of the kindness of his heart, as we know. Um, it's also, you know, 
uh, with hindsight, we know that Putin was presumably already planning the invasion and was probably rub rubbing his hands in glee when he found a chance to kind of show off in Kazakhstan just ahead of that when, you know, Kazakhstan had no idea, presumably, that, um, well, you know, that Putin was about to invade Ukraine, even though, you know, the whole world had been talking about it um, for, for a long time. But, but as for where, but it's clear that Tokayev himself is absolutely determined to push back against the idea that he owes Russia one uh, because of, of that bail, so-called bailout. I mean, I think um, the fact that um, the things that I said before, the fact that um, Kazakhstan has said it won't, or certainly not for now, recognize Luhansk and Donetsk, um, the fact that um, Tokayev has been willing to have contact with Zelensky, um, the fact that um, also that an anti-war rally was um, staged in Amati, even though they, the authorities allowed only one and refused their, uh, all other um, bids to have a rally. Um, I think all those facts show that um, that Tokayev is determined not to be seen as um, the Belarus of Central Asia, that it's not um, going to be a Russian puppet. Um, and I think Tokayev is, you know, is, is clearly sending that signal now, um, as I say, um, First, we don't know what will happen, how the war will play out in Ukraine and what, how and when Russia will emerge or, or not emerge, but ha, what, what Russia, what, how strong or, or weak Russia will be after or, or when it dies down or in a few months or whatever, or even in a few years. Um, none of us know that. Um, but, um, you know, um, and, and none of us know what kind of revenge Russia will then take on, on the kind of, um, you know, on, on what it perceives as disloyal, um, allies. I think that's a very much a, an unknown. Uh, but as I say, Tokaya is determined to show that he doesn't have any uh, any debt to Putin, it seems. Uh, there's a question in the chat from William Courtney. And for audience members, I would just uh, invite you to also uh, put any questions that you have in the chat. So William Courtney says that he very much looks forward to reading your new edition. To what extent are recent political changes helping to open the political system rather than just reshuffling elites? Um, thank you for the question. It's a good question. I mean, I, I personally think that Tokayev is sincere when he think, when he says he's, he, he wants to open the political system uh, because he has. Um, and it, it might have looked uh, good for uh, nearly 30 years, good in inverted commas to maybe to some people outside who 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 bought the line of, of Kazakhstan's stability um, in a volatile region which um, uh, Aspen I love to tout um, but I think Tokayev I, I mean it's hard to judge of course but um, I, I, I think Tokayev does he should open up the political system the proof of whether he is willing not only willing but able to do that will be whether any opposition parties get registered for example um, um, and, and in the coming months as well, because I think people are impatient. Um, as for whether it's reshuffling, reshuffling the same old people, unfortunately at the moment, it actually is. I mean, okay, um, you know, uh, Tokayev has, um, you know, taken his broom through the security forces, um, which is hardly surprising given how disloyal some of them proved, or disloyal and inept, a combination of disloyalty and ineptitude um, that was absolutely alarming in January. Um, and he's got his own people in there now, but they've all come through the system because obviously you can't just put inexperienced people in. But I, I haven't seen any attempt to um, bring new faces really into government either. I mean, when he reshuffled the cabinet immediately after bloody January, we just saw a sort of rotation of the same kind of people. Um, so I think that's worrying. They need new, new, new um, faces and new ideas. Um, and new ways of doing things. And I think the people need to see that as well. I mean, I, you know, he, perhaps Tokayev needs to think about, he doesn't just need to keep bringing people in from who've come through the system, but he can bring in some of independent economists or civil society people. I mean, that would be a bold move, I think, but it's not one he's embraced so far. We, uh, we have a comment here from Ulan, and this is, uh, this is good for you. Uh, so uh, Ulan says that uh, he, he will buy your book and he hopes to get your signature. So he just asked me to, uh, told me, asked me if I could tell you that. Thank you, um, <laughs> definitely. So at, at QMAP, you can have a, a book signing session. Absolutely. Um, so 
after actually before we uh, when you were talking i was thinking about you mentioned about that one rally in early march of uh, the anti-war rally um but then i think several weeks after other people had uh uh, had submit an application for there to be a protest, but then it, it was denied. So how can we think it was only that that one rally was allowed here in Ahmadi? Why were why was the other one denied, and maybe other ones have also been denied? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I think activists who are submitting the applications are asking themselves the same question. I mean, I mean, there are two possible uh, interpretations, really. Um, um, and they're probably not even mutually exclusive. One is that the, um, well, uh, one is that the authorities, the government, um, wanted to allow people to let off steam. Um, two, another, well, another um, related one is that they they thought um, that the government thought that it could show. I mean, that, that it could show, say, the Russians, um, look, we we have this opinion that we have to cater for it. But it would also kind of show that th this opinion exists in society. That 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 society is not all. Russian. Of course, what we don't know in Kazakhstan really because of lack of um, independent proper polling is how many people support the war and how many are against. Um, but I think they wanted to show that perhaps. Um, and why they didn't allow more is, um, uh, well, again, possible interpretations that they, they don't want to be provocative or that they were even spooked by the first one, which was probably much bigger than they'd expected. It's certainly bigger than I'd expected. I mean, maybe two and a half, three thousand people and um, quite vocal. I mean, um, you know, people chanting Putin is a fascist on the streets of Kazakhstan, even if it was in a bit of an out of, a way, out of the way location. Um, they might have spooked the authorities. Um, we don't really know, but it seems that they want to keep a lid on these moods um, now and they don't seem inclined to, to, to allow any other ones because there have been other requests not, and, and not just one, certainly. I mean, I've heard from um, one activist who submitted the request that basically they told, well, you've had your chance to have your say, you've had your say now, so enough. <laughs> but I mean, so I don't think we'll be seeing any more of that anytime soon. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, so Simon Jones asks, is it fair to say that too much democracy is likely to anger Russia? And the best way to maintain security of Kazakhstan's border is to continue along the same path of authoritarianism. Uh, thanks, Simon. Um, this is a very good point. I mean, yes, I think it is fair to say that. I mean, we have seen Russia in the past, um, you know, um, not welcoming, uh, um, you know, when its neighbors um, move um, away from authoritarianism and try to um, democratize. I mean, we've, we've certainly seen that in Ukraine. We've seen it in other places, too. I mean, um, perhaps Kyrgyzstan to a degree as well in our region. And other places. So yes, I mean, I think that is also um, a worry and uh, one that Tokayev undoubtedly must be aware of. I mean, that's that's the um, uh, the paradox. Um, you've got two unresolvable goals, if you like. I mean, it, if if Kazakhstan, Tokayev seems to think, and many people agree that Kazakhstan needs to seriously reform if it is to avoid these kind of problems that we saw, this kind of violence that we saw in January. And that it needs to resolve the contradictions in the system, that it needs to give the people who are demanding it some kind of a voice. And yet, um, on your border, you have um, a, a powerful, aggressive neighbor that does not welcome successful democracies. Um, so all I can say to that is Tokai is not in an enviable position. Um, Russia won't want Kazakhstan to succeed. No. In your book, you've covered the post-colonial legacy of Kazakhstan. Uh, would that be shaken off or reinforced with Russia's increasingly aggressive foreign policy? Ah, uh, well, that's that's another uh, very good and very important question. I mean, um, I think um, Kazakhstan's pushback against the, the attempts to make it fall into line on Ukraine suggests that Tokayev is going to push back against, um, uh, against um, reinforcing that. And those are not the only things that we're seeing that suggest that um, he wants to kind of, um, well, not, not so much re-examine the colonial past, but perhaps yeah, um, shift uh, away from it a bit. And I'm talking about um, things like um, renaming, um, renaming regions. I mean, he, he carried out um, an administrative reform in his, uh, as part of his, um, his, his reform packages, an administrative reform 
um, to create new create new regions in Kazakhstan, and they're all notably named um, with with names that kind of evocative for Kazakhstan after the poet Abai, for example, after the Urutal, the heartland, the Kazakh heartland. Um, and also we've seen um, the renaming of um, the town of, of Kapchigai, which is a new uh, provincial capital, um, after um, Din Muhammad Kunayev, Kazakhstan's um, Soviet era uh, leader for, 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 for sort of three decades, which um, who many Kazakhs Kazakh sort of still admire um, and hark back to some sort of golden age. So we've seen kind of this appeal to Kazakhness. And in, in fact, this week, um, only um, this week, uh, we saw also some some names in West Kazakhstan region. Some, um, sorry, some um, um, towns or villages and and um, districts renamed again Russian with Kazakh names replacing Russian names. Um, now that that just renaming things, of course, doesn't doesn't um, tell any any kind of a whole story. But I think it tells us that um, that Kapkaya, um would like to take Kazakhstan in its own direction. Now again, this is something that Russia doesn't want. Um, certainly, when it comes to to language, um, you know, we know that um, that Putin's one of Putin's pretexts uh, for m much of his aggression is to protect Russian speakers. So again, we, you know, while, while we, you know, we, I, you know, I think um, Tokayev will undoubtedly be aware of any dangers involved with with, with that. We already. Um, with changing policy, say, on language, which I don't think is on the cards at all. Um, although we already see um, commentators claiming without any foundation whatsoever that Russian speakers are being oppressed in Kazakhstan. Um, so I think um, Tokayev is, as with many other things, he's got a juggling act on his hands. He needs to, um, you know, pacify um, demands of Kazakh grassroots as well for, for decolonialization or perhaps, you know, that's a Perhaps not the right way to put it, but you know that people who feel that more should be done about Kazakh language to promote it and and um, you know um, history and, um, and and to move away from the Russian colonial past, but at the same time he needs to um, you know make sure he doesn't anger the Russian population here, the ethnic Russian population, and of course um, Russia as well. So we're going to see a, a, another juggling act. In fact, he's going to be keeping his balls in the air on. <laughs> Um, on many counts, I think, over a few years. So G <clears throat> Gary Hayes asks a question. Um, can you give your thoughts on the other big neighbor, that is China? Uh, does China act as a counterweight to Russia? Tokayev has lots of Chinese experience and contacts, and some of the problems in the West are also anti-Chinese as are the Uyghur problems in the East. Um, thank you, Gary, uh, for the question. I think definitely um, Kazakhstan um, sees and probably has always seen um, China as, as a counterweight to Russia. And I mean, that ga gains much more um, importance in a situation um, that we have now with Russia invading a neighbor um, in the West, um, in, in its West, in Russia's West. Um, so, uh, for Kazakhstan, having a powerful ally in the East cannot be um, cannot be a bad thing, and certainly they see it as a, a, a powerful um, counterbalance. Um, of course, um, weighed against that, we see um, China um, uh, appeasing um, Russian policy, if not if not outright supporting it. Um, we see we see China as a Russian enabler. Of course, what we don't know is. Um, whether uh, China, if uh, in the hypothetical situation a long way down the line, if Russia were to invade or think about invading a Central Asian country, and it would obviously be Kazakhstan in that case, um, we don't know how China would react to, to, well, we can imagine that China's reaction would be a bit different if it was on its own doorstep, I think. Um, so that, um, I'm sure um, that, that um, officials in Kazakhstan see that as some kind of, um, well, I don't know about protection, but counterweight, so definitely a big counterweight. Weighed against that um, xenophobia in Kazakhstan, which has only risen in, re in recent years, um, especially because of what, we took, what I mentioned about the treatment of Kazakhs in Xinjiang. But that's kind of, the, the government tries to treat that as a completely separate issue. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I, I, I guess um, the, the Kazakh government certainly will want to keep good relations with China um, most definitely as a counterweight to Russia. And on the topic of China, because uh, some people argue that with the 
massive uh, increase in China's economic involvement in Central Asia, that this results in a decrease in power of Russia, uh, that in the years to come, uh, we should expect uh, that the Chinese government will make more security gains in the region. And as a result of that uh, decrease of security um, involvement or uh, security, Russia's um, standing in terms of security issues in the region. What are your thoughts about that? Do you think in the next, say, uh, decade or several decades, uh, do you think that Russia's power influence in the region will decline and China's will increase due to this, this uh, economic presence? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I mean, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, and of course, much de depends on how um, the war plays out for Russia um, and how it emerges from that. Um, in terms of um, economic footprint, I mean, it, 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 you know, um, China's economic footprint in Central Asia has become absolutely massive. Um, and, um, you know, this has given it um, kind of a hold over over the Central Asian countries, especially some of those that are deeply in hoc, um, such as Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. But of course, Kazakhstan too, not wanting to, to turn away or to, to spook Chinese investment. Um, you know, Kazakhstan also in, in, uh, gives a hold on Kazakhstan too. Um, in terms of the security presence, it's always been so much more muted than, than Russia's um, security presence. And I mean, right now, at the moment, I can't see that changing. Um, and also with Russia projecting hard power um, constantly, I mean, I, I, I don't imagine China wanting to come into some kind of conflict, um, although obviously Russia is very distracted right now. Um, but as for, uh, as for whether, you know, how China's influence will grow political um, as well as economic in the region, um, it's really hard to predict um, with the unpredictabilities of the war and, and the way that Russia will come out of this. It's really hard to predict, uh, predict how that will play out for China in Central Asia. I don't see its mm, presence shrinking, um, probably growing. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, um, we see so much talk over the last decade of how China's ousting Russia from this region. Um, but of course, what people, you know, often um, forget about is the linguistic, the cultural influence, political, linguistic, whereas China's influence has been so much more economic. And, I, 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 you know, we don't see Russia's political and cultural and linguistic influence really diminishing, certainly not in Kazakhstan anyway. Um, so I think, um, you know, I, I think China's influence may well rise, but it's hard to predict the paths that will take when we don't know um, how much Russia will be giving attention to Central Asia and to Kazakhstan, or how much its attention will have to be continued to be focused on um, its Western borders. Next question comes from Jadura uh, regarding debt to China. Um, and her question is um, specific regarding Kazakhstan, but if you'd like to talk about, because the other two main countries in Central Asia, uh, Kyrgyzstan, um, and, um, and Tajikistan in terms of massive bilateral debt with China. But, um, but Jadura asks, what are the odds that Kazakhstan will be able to pay off its debt to China? Good question. <laughs> and I don't have data um, to hand about what, China, what Kazakhstan's debt to China currently is. I mean, I think, um, I'm guessing that, I mean, I think, I guess things depend, it depends on how, um, the economic situation plays out, and that goes for um, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan too, um, in terms of indebtedness to China. And that, and, and obviously, I mean, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan generally um, at much more risk, um, uh, not much more risk um, economically, but because of the um, expected big drops in remittances um, this year to those two countries when they are so remittance dependent, um, you know, they, they, they're going to find their economies struggling uh, enormously. And but, but again, without knowing the actual terms of the debts to China, all we know is that they are deeply indebted to China and that they always um, struggle to pay their debts. Kazakhstan, um, I really, it's hard for me to say, but I suspect that um, the terms of the debts, I don't know. I mean, as I say, it's really hard for me to say, but I'm, I'm guessing that it will keep on top of the debt, but I, I really am guessing on that, I'm afraid. Sorry not to give a fuller answer. No problem. 
Um, there's a question about the likelihood of assassinations uh, regarding <clears throat> uh, Nazarbayev-aligned elites. Um, so in terms of uh, your thoughts about the likelihood of assassinations focused, target, or directed at um, supporters of Tokayev or uh, Nazarbayev. Wow. <laughs> um, well, yes, I mean, we, we have, you know, seen um, certainly one, um, at least one political assassination in Kazakhstan in 2006 of the murder of opposition leader Altenbeck Sassenbayev and other suspicious deaths. Um, uh, I mean, I personally think that, that um, you know, Kazakhstan has changed a great deal since then and that, um, you know, rogue members of um, Nazarbayev's family at the time um, were acting with impunity and literally getting away with murder. I, I don't think that um, Tokayev's entourage has that kind of person in it. Um, of course, never say never, but I mean, it, um, I mean, I, I can't imagine it happening. But then there are many things that we can't imagine happening, including such violence on the streets of Almaty as we saw in January. Um, another unknown factor um, is, you know, the kind of people who stoke that violence. Um, we don't know, um, well, we don't know how far they're prepared to go or what they're capable of if they're not um, uh, neutralized or kept in check. We don't know if they have been effectively neutralized or kept in check. And by neutralized, I mean, I, I don't mean um, physically eliminated. I mean, you know, politically neutralized. So um, I, I, I wouldn't uh, expect it to happen, but um, I think the rule in Kazakhstan nowadays is expect the unexpected. In, so you mentioned before that this book project started back in 2015 um when you decided to check out that town um, which people are falling asleep and slipping in the comas and then uh recently updated it so do you anticipate that you'll be updating this book again in say five or ten years or other other book projects that uh you might be thinking about well i mean the, the book um dark shadows requires an update already <laughs> But I am, I, I guess, um, you know, with the new edition just out, um, this um, new edition is three and a half years after the original edition. Um, so I guess it wouldn't be on the cards for, for a few years. Um, as for book projects, well, we have a lot of interesting countries in Central Asia. In fact, we have five of them. Um, so, um, you know, I guess uh, a bit tied up with um, events in Kazakhstan right now. But um, down the line, who knows? Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things happening in Uzbekistan, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and of course, always in Tajikistan, Turkmenistan too. So I guess we'll see. It, it, again, um, if there are no, because we have a few minutes left, in terms of the voting in the General Assembly about how Central Asian states um, did not side with Russia regarding um, uh, the UN condemning Russia, were you surprised at all by that in terms of Central Asian states either abstaining or not showing up to vote as opposed to um, supporting in voting in favor of Russia? Um, I, I think I was, I was not so much surprised by Kazakhstan, which has formed for doing this um, in, in, during the Crimea crisis, well, during 2014 over Crimea and so on. Um, some of the other states maybe that are a little more, um, um, like, for example, Tajikistan, which has maintained such a silence on, on the war, um, you know, it was maybe a little bit surprising that it didn't side with Russia. But I think generally, um, I think generally um, the Central Asian states, um, they don't want to be on the wrong side of history, maybe. So I guess um, not, not siding with Russia it, um, was their way of showing that. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so for uh, ho hopefully we will get the, um, the book at the KIMAP library soon. Um, I'm, cer I'm certainly interested in, in reading this. And Ulan had mentioned that also. So thank you all. Thank, well, um, Joanna, thank you very much for talking about your book. Uh, we, we enjoyed this discussion very much, and we hope to have you back again soon. Thank you very much. It's been a, a great discussion, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Have a good evening, everyone.